Welcome to the OKD Working Group meeting for May 10th of the year 2002. And uh, there's a link to the uh, meeting notes in the chat. Put it again for any folks that have just joined. And take a quick look at it and uh, let me know if there's anything that you feel that you want to add or change. And don't forget to put your name in the uh, attendees list. Uh, that helps us know who's here uh, and who we might need to reach out to if they weren't here for something important. All right, let's go ahead and start with the first agenda item, which is always our updates in terms of releases. And I believe we have Christian here today. So Christian, take it away. Yeah, sure. I don't really have a big update, but I saw that Vadim has cut another release. Um, I haven't been able to check any, any of the comments um, that might be there um, for this release. But yeah, I'm happy to uh, gather feedback here now that I will check on the forums or on the discussion uh, later as well. But probably no, the big, no. Yeah. Big probably the biggest points. thing for that release is probably the etcd fix um, that is supposedly, that is in there, uh, that's supposed to fix the uh, possible data, um, the data issues. But uh, that looks to be the biggest thing. And, they, and the installer fix is there for uh, VMware. Those are probably the two biggest things. So Christian, do we have a sense of, um, and I don't want to pin anyone to anything, but it, will it be you or Vadim or a combination of you and Vadim in the near future cutting releases? Or who, who do we know who's going to be cutting the releases? Is there a way for us to know? Uh, I, I think there is currently no way for you to know. Uh, we will, essentially what we're trying to do is we will find, uh, or we already know which team internally will pick up responsibility for doing that. Um, and it'll just be uh, shared better, the workload. We don't want to have it all on Vadim's shoulders, but we want to have an entire team that is re responsible and they will uh, take turns um, doing the releases, which is also a great onboarding experience for uh, for engin or new engineers um, that come into the OpenShift organization, obviously. So we will um, use that as something they can, uh, gather experience with, and obviously we'll, as a side benefit, uh, it, there will be less work uh, on on the core maintainers um, for, for the actual releases. We're currently uh, in the process of working out the details there. So I, I can't name anybody, it would be too early for that, but there is going to be an entire team uh, that will uh, take on the, this responsibility. Excellent. Fantastic. Uh, is anyone else? Oh, go ahead. I couldn't have said it any better yet. We've got a bunch of people lined up, but we haven't named the players yet. It's kind of like the NFL draft. Excellent. And any other uh, questions or comments in terms of uh, OKD releases? Anything for Christian? I may, maybe just a quick heads up. Um, and I mentioned that earlier. We will uh, introduce some changes to the way we build OKD. So one of the things we're going, I, I actually am going to do or trying to do uh, soon is um, moving the, the OKDOS builds back into our Prow system uh, from the external Cirrus CI that we have. We want to move that back into Prow so we have um, just more ease of maintenance, uh, especially now that we want to uh, give the responsibility for cutting releases to another team. Um, and uh, yeah, we want to try and pull that back in. And also, yeah, that, that'll just enable us to do things internally uh, and also enable us to do more things internally than just that one build that we currently do. 
uh, just as a quick heads up, there's no deadline for this set yet, uh, but uh, it'll probably be formalized and written up as, as Jira cards uh, sometime soon. And more as well, but I, I don't want to mention too much of, of the work we're going to do. So a lot of positive unknowns on the horizon, it sounds like. I would say so, yes. All right, anything else from anybody in terms of the releases? All right, uh, moving on now to uh, the Fedora Core OS updates with Timothy. Hey, yeah. Okay, can you hear me correctly? Hey? Yes, I, I think we can hear you. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, all right, so for today, the main thing for Fedora Core side is that we are moving uh, the testing release to Fedora 6 today, which has been released today too. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, yeah, so we're moving forward to Fedora 6 and this will be in table in two weeks. Uh, I don't remember exactly which version is shipped in OKD right now, but I think it's 34 something. And hopefully, uh, yeah, so we're going to stop using 35 really soon uh, in two weeks. Basically, uh, so yeah. Uh, and apart from that, there's also I've put a link into the and D, and we've started something. Maybe I don't know if we, I mentioned it here before, but we're sending you this month in Fedora Caress uh, some 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 sort of summary uh, that you can find on the discussion forum, in the Fedora discussion forum, and that that really helps you get a little bit of overview of uh, what's happening in Fedora Cores uh, across months uh, and uh, changes along, along the line. So uh, do check them out and we try to publish them regularly uh, every month. And uh, the final, and yeah, and that's, and that's what's it for me. Uh, Any Timothy, could you from folks in terms of CoreOS stuff? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just Timothy, could you uh, paste the link to that latest uh, monthly summary? Awesome, thank you very much. All right. Any other comments or questions uh, on the Fedora CoreOS aspects? All right. Well, moving right along, let's go to the docs updates with Brian. Okay, so we had a meeting um, last week. Um, a few things come out of it. Um, <clears throat> we've published the style updates that Brandon did. So you should see, particularly in the light rendering, um, it's, it's easier to read, better contrast. Not so much in the dark, if you like dark mode, but in the light mode, um, there have been a number of changes there. Um, We've got the community archive, um, the community repo archived, and we're beginning to try and tidy up the repos ready for moving to the new org and, and coming up with the process of actually moving into the OKD project org. I would of the OpenShift. Um, dun, dun, dun. What's new? Okay, so Twitter. Um, slight snag on the Twitter account. We needed to change the email address. That is in progress. And we finally got access to the survey. So if you go to, if you're interested, if you can go to the, the HackMD meeting, you'll get a link to the survey if anybody wants to look at it, update it before we actually finally send it out. Um, but we are planning to send the community survey out um, fairly soon. Um, and then I did move one issue into a discussion, and that is <laughs> the good old topic of communication channels. Um, there was a request to actually sort of um, publicize the matrix channel, but no one seems to be using it. So uh, just a, a really discussion as to is that something that we want to actively promote and if we do are people actually going to use it um, because if, 
if we invite people to use an, a channel, then some of the community do need to be there and respond to questions and comments. Obviously, we rationalize the Slack channel down to the one user channel. Um, we've started using the discussion forum in GitHub as the primary um, mechanism for getting questions answered. So do we want to add yet another channel? Um, thoughts, comments? I'd be open to I'd be open to using the matrix channel, uh, but yeah, I haven't seen a lot of engagement. If I'm, I'm trying to check whether I'm already on the channel, matrix is a bit slow for me today. Um, but yeah, in in general, I I do like matrix, and I think um, it's a good alternative to Slack. But we should probably uh, agree on one avenue and not have both simultaneously. Or at least agree on one main main communication channel. So Vadim chimed in on the discussion that he thought it would be helpful to have multiple uh, places, particularly if they could be bridged. I think you know Brian makes the good point of if we're going to have places, they have to be staffed, so to speak. Uh, in the sense that there have to be people there in the community that are actively engaging and helping and whatnot. Otherwise, people are going to be asking questions into the uh, to the yeah. abyss, basically. So, um, my, from, this is John. From my point of view, honestly, I mean, I'm I'm busy enough watching Slack and the OKD discussion groups and the issues. I'm not sure if I necessarily want to look at yet another place where you know content could be coming in i mean if we're gonna in my mind if we're gonna move then let's move and not use slack at all but like i said in the in the chat the advantage we get with slack currently is that we also get the ocp stuff you know if somebody has questions about ocp you know that kind of relate to you know okd we see that also and a lot of the ocp folks are on there also just my thoughts and i I mean, I'm not against it, but I'm not sure if I would be sitting on it like I do now. I, I, I guess one of the challenges we have, the more channels we have, we encourage cross-posting like we used to have where everybody just posts to every mm -hmm. possible channel to get a question. We got quite a lot of that in the past. So... Um... Yeah, I, I'm trying to let everybody else weigh in on this. I mean, I, I have an opinion, but it's, you know, my, I, I'm, I'm along the lines of John Porton. I'm watching enough channels um, and I haven't ever, I, even every time we ask, I haven't even been able to log into the matrix, not because there's anything wrong with it. It's just that I haven't even found the time to go and do that and, and retest it because I tested it ages ago. I got in and I'm sure I forgot it. So, um, I, I'm for, I guess, not opening yet another one, but um, yeah, we're missing a few people who are very pro matrix on the on this call right now. Um, yeah, I think, I think Neil was the driving force behind it, um, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm sure he's going to come in and, into the conversation at some point. Um, yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> If we're opening Matrix, then the question is, do we, do we want to keep Slack going? Or, um, I, 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 is it possible with Matrix to actually consolidate? Um, Chris, Vadim seemed to say that you could yeah. use one channel to consolidate them all. Um, <laughs> I, really, that is, that is Matrix. You can bridge it with all, with all kinds of other platforms. I'm not sure how well the Slack integration works or Slack bridging. Uh, but you could certainly kind of add a box that would cross post everything that goes into Slack. It would also post that on on Matrix. Um, I, I do think as a we don't have to use it as our main channel, but we could because it's already there and a few folks are in there, and especially the Fedora community is very active on on Matrix because it's essentially the IRC replacement there, and Matrix also bridges through to IRC. Yeah. Um, so 
yeah, I, I, I would suggest we just keep it and maybe we add uh, in the room description, we just add a link to the Slack channel and, and maybe also we can have something like uh, team tags on, on both Slack and Matrix where we could point people towards, uh, you know, tag this team and then we'll have uh, individual contributors uh, getting notified and, and hopefully answer to whatever the inquiry is. I, I just don't speak. want to lose the the Fedora community side when we say we, we're going to we're closing the the, the matrix channel again. Uh, I fear we we might be losing out on some good okay. uh, contributions well, say, from the Fedora side. I think it's been a, a month to six weeks. <laughs> I don't think anyone's actually found it or used it yet. So um, yeah, I mean, if, if somebody is a matrix sort of guru and wants to work out if it's possible to do that cross posting and integration, which means that we can still just keep watching on one channel. I have, I, I think that would be the best solution then. If the Fedora community like using matrix, they can come in the matrix store. If people like using Slack, they can come in the Slack door and everybody sees everything else. <coughs> so we can then only just <coughs> track one. I think that that's the best of both worlds. Yeah, Brian. Uh, like I, I sort of, uh, well, I think John had an excellent point, uh, and I totally agree that few, less is better, but um, what you're saying is that basically Red Hat itself is, uh, you know, half using Slack, half using Matrix, and so if you're only using one, you're going to lose half, and both Fedora and OCP are big feeders into OKD. So I don't think, I don't know how you could throw away one of those communities. So it may be that we will just have to live with both and try and make it work. And, and a lot of the OpenShift developers aren't on the, on the upstream Kubernetes Slack because we have a separate instance, an internal one. Um, and while the matrix channel really is open to everybody, of course, and well, so is the, the Slack channel that we have, but we, you don't, yeah, there's many developers who aren't uh, who aren't on the Kubernetes Slack, who might then be on Matrix instead. So does it sound like if we wanted to rope in more people from sort of a particip participatory side, Matrix might be the place because there are more sort of active technical developers and admins and DevOps and, and whatnot. Does that sound about right to folks? It's also that Matrix is the preferred way because it's for, for the Fedora uh, community because it's open source, uh, obviously, yeah. as opposed to Slack. Uh, and it's, it's very featureful, uh, I would say. Um, and we'll probably get a lot more in people coming to flocking to matrix in the future as it grows. And I wouldn't necessarily expect that from our Slack channel alone. But definitely I, I wouldn't I wouldn't like close any of those two channels. I think it's good to have to be present on, on both platforms. Well I'm happy to, to troll around in the matrix. Sometimes I forget to log back in after I close all my tabs, but uh, I'm can, happy there's to a, around. Does a, anyone else? There's a flat pack you can install, and you can also save the IRC credentials in the, on the bridge, so it logs you back in automatically. Um, if you're interested in that, I have a write-up uh, for how to do that. Well, what do folks think? No it's, promises it's, that I'll be on it. I'll look at it. <laughs> it, it. It sounds like everybody wants fewer channels, but we think that it's important to to maintain a matrix presence to capture the Fedora community. So I am looking for a volunteer that can do that integration between Slack and Matrix. Maybe when Neil. 
<laughs> when Neil's about, maybe, maybe we volunteer Neil in his absence. <laughs> I think we volunteer Neil, and then um, I'll try and reach him next week um, while we're at KubeCon and I'm in, um, we're in the right time zones, um, and see if we can get it get it working. So I'll I'll volunteer and um, I'll reach out to Neil because he seems to know the most about it. And um, then I'm 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 buying dinner for Christian at some time so we can all test it together <laughs> over a glass of sangria or something. Right. <laughs> Plying people with alcohol for testing sounds like a good plan. Alcohol and paella. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian. You got anything else in terms of documentation stuff? Um, I think that's it. Um, we did open the discussion. There is a discussion item on the transition to the repos. That's where we're going to be discussing the plan uh, to transition to the new repos. So expect conversation starting there shortly. Uh, particularly, Brian and I have both been busy respectively, but I think we'll start chiming in on that and hammer out a plan pretty quickly to move to the new repo. Uh, all right, moving on to um, bu, 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 bu. next up is, sorry, I'm a little discombobulated today. Uh, <clears throat> da, 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 we talked about the survey, talked about the documentation, um, Rooksef status, um, is that taken care of now, John, do you know? Uh, I know that it was put into the upstream for the kernel, but I don't know when that's going to hit anything that we're, that we're actually using. <clears throat> uh, I don't know how to find that out. That'd probably have to be a Fedora, Ethos type of thing. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, John? Yeah, I was looking at uh, that whole chain of things, um, and it, it looks like uh, it's actually a Ceph uh, project in the kernel, uh, looking at the patch that uh, was put in. Uh, well, it was, so, a, it was a change for the Ceph driver, but somebody on the kernel side is, is who applied it, so it'll come in on a kernel change. Right, although... As I added the uh, the Bugzilla report that contains the comment uh, with the patch uh, is still open, so I, I would assume that mm -hmm. they close that uh, when it makes it in. And then um, what wasn't clear to me is uh, whether or not that patch actually does us any short-term good, uh, because um, if you're on four nine. Um, the only way you can get to 4.10 at the moment is by getting to the earliest 4.10, which is the only upgrade path. Uh, and presumably that wouldn't have the patch That's in correct. it, which would, which would mm -hmm. mean that your uh, Ceph would be turfed, and then you'd have to recreate, like sort of patch it by hand and recreate all of the PVs, uh, which yeah. doesn't sound like a fun experience, really. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I don't think we're going to see that that go into a 4.9, you know, even a nightly release. I mean, I I could be wrong, but I don't I don't see us doing that. Um, Christian, what do you think? Yeah, we it might land in a nightly, but I'm I'm definitely not going to work on backporting that there because we we focus on 4.10 now. Unfortunately, yeah. um, it's not out of the question that you could upgrade directly, but obviously we haven't tested it. So maybe we can uh, just test it before the uh, before the next release, um, kind of yeah. test the direct upgrade strategy where we just skip the release. There, there isn't uh, an obvious reason that it shouldn't work, but obviously there might be, yeah. there might be I, some edge cases. I already. just, I'll be curious to know whether it's gonna hit 4.10, because so I don't know how long it takes for, you know, a kernel patch to make it you know, from upstream to Red Hat, you know, in Fedora, um, and then, you know, forward to our releases. So if it lands in Fedora 36, we should be getting it in uh, 11.4.10. Yeah, I, I think because we, well, that, that is, I, we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> do, we, do we do major upgrades uh, 
of Fedora within one minor OKD version. Uh, I think my, we should. My vote least... is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've seen in the past that that does create issues for us, um, but sometimes it doesn't. So we will definitely test it. If it upgrades, um, fine. If it doesn't, we'll have to see um, whether that kernel gets backported to Fedora 35, which we're currently on. And that, that's that's a possibility as well. Fedora 35 is going to be maintained for another six months. So um, not not Fedora Core OS, but uh, the Fedora package packages themselves, the RPMs, the kernel, everything. So um, if we don't, uh, if we can't make it work with uh, 36, we can we can definitely open a Bugzilla so it gets backported to to the Fedora 35 kernel. If that isn't happening any uh, already. Is you're on mute. I don't know how we did that. But anyway, so there's a there's a link to the kernel uh, to the patch, but I'm not sure you know who can track that to see where it is in terms of the uh, where it is in the process. I guess that's kind of what we need to know. Yeah, we, we'll have to uh, get the Fedora kernel maintained as it. Do you want to take that, or does Timothy? Do you want to take that? If there's a Bugzilla already, it should be the assigned person, and you can uh, okay. uh, maybe just add a need info or something. Jeff uh, Layton. Just... Looks like, yeah, looks like he, Jeff Layton. He should be the guy, yeah. Okay. What do you want me to do? I'm not sure. I thought of. So there's a kernel patch that uh, is to fix a Ceph bug. Um, if you look in the uh, in the meeting notes, there's a link to it. And we're just curious when you know that might hit Fedora. Is it going to hit Fedora at 36? Is it, you know, is it going to be backported to 35? Because um, it's a significant bug um, for multiple people. You know, Bruce can't update to 4.10 uh, because of the bug. Um, so this is just one of those things that we've been dealing with for the last month or so. So this is up to Fedora itself and the Kindle team. So I'm trying to find the bug. And yeah, essentially we should ask them to backport it to 35. The question says, the patch even hit Fedora yet? Because they saw by that, you know, at kernel, you know, has it reached Fedora in any yeah. manner? It needs to then upstream first, probably, and then we can backport. I'm currently looking at mm -hmm. where things are. Yeah, I, I guess we can follow follow that on the Bugzilla. Uh, we'll make sure to ask there uh, for a backport if they don't already plan on doing it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, and I, I guess it would be useful to know um, sort of what the outcome is because uh, if there's you know w you know if there's basically no way to upgrade to a working version. Of 4.10 from 4.9, then I might as well, you know, just do the update, throw away all my PVs, you know, after of course backing them up, uh, and then recreate everything from scratch uh, on on the Ceph side, uh, which is at it's least a definitely plan. worth worth trying to upgrade it. There, there isn't really a reason um, it's, it shouldn't work. It's just we don't recommend it because we don't test it. We don't have the capacity to test. It. Uh, more than one upgrade uh, path at the moment, but it's it's certainly theoretically possible that you could upgrade from 4.9 directly to the newest 4.10 that includes that fix once it comes out. Uh, right, by forcing it, you mean? 
Right, yeah, you'd have to, exactly, you'd have to uh, use the forest flag because it's not in our upgrade graph, so it'll, it'll complain, but, um, and we, we can test that too, we can, uh, I can make a note for the next, uh, or for the release that includes this one, um, that we test uh, upgrades from 4.9 directly. It might not succeed, and then we, we might have to take up a contingency sure. plan. Yeah, no, I've got, uh, I've got actually a test platform that I've got the, you know, is updated, you know, to the, the latest 4.10 version, and that that doesn't have stuff on it, and it works like a charm. Uh, so that's good. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I guess I can wait a month and see what happens, watchful waiting. Is there anything else? Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, go ahead, Christian. Yeah. Um... Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, obviously you could override the kernel manually on each node, um, but that is uh, a lot of manual work, and we don't want to really recommend anybody doing that. Uh, so yeah, if 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 you can wait, um, I think that might be the best option. Well, the other issue too that we have to think about is that right now we have a pin kernel because of the uh, issue with the kernel um, crapping out. So. We have to get we have to make sure that that gets fixed before we can even you know look at updating to a kernel with the fix. So there's a variety of things that have to happen before that becomes live. We have to have a working kernel. Absolutely. Anything else on this topic? Moving on. Uh... Diane, have you reached out to the Operate First folks, or do, do we even need to do that anymore, um, given changes happening backstage? Um, I have reached out. I've had a couple of conversations with them. They are coming to KubeCon next week, so I was going to coerce them over paella and wine, sit down with uh, Christian and Vadim, um, and uh, make them talk to each other and see if it's even viable on the, it's the Boston University mass open cloud that has some hosting resources for people who aren't aware um and there's some resources inside of red hat on the operate first and i was hoping to get them to do the code ready containers um and we'll see if we can force them to that stage and then maybe even a community build process get lucky for using fedora core os well let me yeah, ask the effort is uh, well, let me let me ask first with the the Paisley elephant in the room, Christian. If the changes that you're talking about in the background happen, is there going to be a need for um, automated community build testing, or do you think that the expanded testing in this new situation? will cover a lot more territory than currently OKD automated testing does? Um, I think both. It, so we, we shouldn't see the, the internal reorganization as, um, as solving what we want to solve with Operate first. I think we still want to have those additional resources and kind of community builds um, available because what we're going to change internally isn't going to, there is going to be changes, but um, not all of them are, are really uh, end user facing. So the first thing of just pulling the build back into Prowl from Cirrus isn't really going to change anything to the outside. It's just that we internally have a much more streamlined process that isn't shelling out to a third platform uh, that we don't control ourselves. So um, we we still want to enable true community builds and rebuilds um, from folks outside of Red Hat, which currently because they can't, nobody can access Prowl and use Prowl. So if we have um, this community build project on operate first, that would still be a huge benefit. So I'm, I think we, we, we're just going to do both. And uh, for example, uh, DRC builds aren't going to be pulled into, into what I'm doing with Prowl now. Um, that still has to be solved. Uh, you know, if, if operate first has, uh, has resources to, to enable community users or community members to, to rebuild parts or all of OpenShift themselves, then that is still, that, that's out of scope for what I'm doing with the Prow internally. But Christian, the Prow internal, that's going to allow us to do pull requests and stuff as normal, right? Which we can't do. 
Exactly. It's uh, especially on the OKD machine OS side. Um, currently, you can't you can create a pull request, but the, the CI is only going to run if the uh, if the branch is from the same repository, and only uh, Red Hat folks can obviously create new branches on that repo. Um, and that is going to change. So that is going to be it's much easy. It's going to be much easier for for community members to open a PR and actually have it tested without us uh, first moving that branch into the repo. Um, that is one of the main reasons to do it, yeah. That's fantastic. That will be nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. And, um, I'm still working on gathering info. Charo is not here. Daniel, I have not seen. Um, serial output for installs. Uh, this came up. Um, Someone give me the context, because actually Timothy's here and can probably answer this. What was remind me of what the context, or remind the group what the context was of this? We had someone that was asking. Oh, it was the person that was having the issue with the the RCOS images versus the FCOS images. Right, Eric, you're here. Right, and yep. what was your question about serial console stuff? Yeah, I forget I what it was, of, yeah. Yeah, I sort of figured it out, so I wrote it in the notes that uh, during the bootstrap or the uh, bare metal IPI, I was interested in getting serial output from the machines that are getting booted. And the way I did it is on the bootstrap node, I go into this directory where the uh, ironic service generates the configuration files and then just add whatever I needed. But I don't know if there's a, a process where you can do that without yeah, doing it manually like this. But at least I figured something out where I actually get serial output, which was quite handy. Timothy and yeah, I'm not sure there is a more streamlined way to do to doing it. Um, but have you documented what you did? Uh, could you share a link? Is it in the in the agenda? It's in the agenda. I just there's a wrote. note. Yeah, manually editing the uh, configuration, the bootstrap. All right. Thank you very much. I will I will follow up on that if there's. Uh, yeah, if there's a better way to do it, um, I, I'll find out. Yeah, and I think the other patch John had for uh, passing down the args will solve the problem with the Fedora CoreOS, the the Red Hat CoreOS, uh, when the the nodes are getting installed. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Right. About uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure if that patch is going to change that, but. Because you know, when I looked at the bare installer, I mean, it looked like was everything in it was talking, to, you know, referencing FCOS images. So I'm wondering if there's another piece that buried deep that has Arcos images built into it for bare metal. And I'm not sure where to look for that. But I can't reproduce it, so I don't, I can't, uh, I can't deep dive into it. The last problem I'm still having with the bare metal installation is uh, my networking setup. But then I think I can actually do, take that with the OpenShift itself because it doesn't work at yeah with the OpenShift installer either. And what were the specifics of your networking setup that you were running into? Oh yeah, uh, so. What I'm trying to do is, yeah, I'm not providing two separate NICs. I'm providing one NIC with two VLANs, the native where the provisioning can happen, and then a different VLAN, like 10 or something, uh, that the bare metal can continue on. And it's not one NIC, it's a bond of multiple NICs. And the thing I read was in like 4.10, you can actually specify an, uh, an NM state, I think they call it, yeah. where you supply the configuration. So they actually show up with the full networking and everything. But uh, during the ironic Python agents um, part of it, 
that they lose network because they start probing every single network interface for LLDP and figures out VLANs and stuff. And then, yeah, I, I lose complete network. So that's where the serial console comes in. So I know what I've done, and I've done on VMware, and I've rebooted a node um, and stopped it at at the single single user mode. You can go in there. You can. There's a couple of console pieces that you can delete, and then reboot it. It'll come up in the single user node mode. But I'm not sure if that'll help in your case because you want to see it while it's actually booting for real. Yeah. Well, yeah, so the uh, just editing the files where you get the serial output helps a lot, and then you can just pass another thing that allows uh, the serial getty service to just, whenever something makes a connection on the serial port, you're automatically logged in as root. Great, and Timothy left a link in the in the chat there for serial console config and for FCOS. Uh, some helpful info there. Thanks, I'll have a look at this. I, I think this is also essentially uh, configuring after the fact that what we really want is to provide that kernel argument up front and then have the machine come up uh, with it immediately. So um, Ignition does have uh, support for, for setting kernel arguments, so you might be able to just set it in Ignition. Uh, oh, that yeah. setting though, is not going to be uh, respected or understood by the machine config operator. It has a, a shim API uh, in the machine config object. Um, and there is a JIRA card uh, open to move the MCO to to the ignition native API, but that hasn't happened yet. But if you if you specify the if you specify that in the ignition, um, that gets uh, downloaded by the by the nodes at provisioning time, um, then that might already work. I'm not sure if you you then also have to create a machine config object uh, to reflect that. I, I don't think so because nothing is going to check if, if there's a difference. Uh, but if you only def if you only add the machine config object, uh, that is essentially a day two operation because uh, doesn't doesn't do it through kernel arcs uh, or through ignition, but it has a separate process for for setting those arcs later on. So it won't just come up with the right uh, kernel arguments right away. All right. Have a look into that as well, I suppose. <laughs> Let's see if we can get it running first, and then. Excellent. All right. Uh, next up is uh, ta -ta 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 -ta, find out about bare metal API installing Arcos nodes we talked about. And that's about it. Um, is there anything else that folks want to bring to the table uh, at this meeting? Uh, I guess I have a question if we have time. Sure. Um, so uh, I, I've been wrestling for an interminable amount of time uh, on uh, an issue that happened in, in upgrading to from uh, I guess 4.7 to 4.8 uh, when uh, one of the operators that I had installed on 4.7 wasn't supported on 4.8 and in the upgrade uh, it turned out that uh, some stuff was left over uh, from the old operator uh, and then that turned out to uh, cause a uh, an internal error with OC get, which then prevented uh, pods and uh, packages and God knows what else from being deleted. And uh, because when you ran OC to try and find out what the problem was, you got an internal server error. So that was sort of annoying. In a long, you know, comedy after a long comedy path, uh, I finally had time to track it down, um, and it, it turned out to be like a, uh, uh, a relatively trivial fix. Uh, but uh, 
then I noticed uh, when I, you know, like in the, in the path of chasing it down, uh, I uninstalled the uh, StrimZ operator. Um, and then I noticed that even after the StrimZ operator was uninstalled, I have all these StrimZ CRDs hanging around. And so then I started to wonder, well, okay, so how much other stuff is there that just gets left when we upgrade that's no longer useful and can still perhaps cause problems as it did in this uh, this one case. Um, and uh, the uh, so in in my uh, uh, I left sort of a discussion set of breadcrumbs on that, uh, uh, which uh, you can look in the uh, OKD discussions. Um, and uh, I think n nobody's commented on the alleged bugs that I put there, so I haven't yet created any bugs. But it seems to me that if OC gets returns an internal server error, that that ought to be a bug somewhere, probably in OCP. Um, but uh, what I don't know is philosophically uh, how much stuff should be hanging around if if you uninstall an operator or if you get rid of an operator when you upgrade, uh, you know, because the uh, like without an operator you might still have objects that are still functioning, and so you can't necessarily eliminate all of the CRDs. But uh, anyway, when thinking about it for about five seconds, it seemed like that was a non-trivial issue that you couldn't just do something and it would work in all cases. But uh, I don't know if people have thought about that in upgrades. I have thought of it, and I've run into the issue as well when uh, removing operators that, uh, yeah, there is some crud left around that, that will prevent things from updating. And I got bit, I remember which operator it was, but uh, yeah, I mean, basically I had to go around manually deleting stuff and then killing pods to so let things refresh and, and whatnot. It'd be interesting to document those. Bruce, can you put links to your breadcrumbs uh, if you have any discussions or thing? Put them in the meeting notes, and then that way we can bring them to the uh, attention of the larger community. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sure. Well, it's just uh, I will do that. Excellent. I mean, it might be part of just how the operators were built. And they don't either they don't clean up by design or they didn't think about it because there are some operators that are designed to be removed, but also be able to be reinstalled and not lose your configurations. Right. So it, it's probably really operator dependent on how well they clean up. Be interesting to, you know, just look at some operators and get a sense of, of which operators fall into which category of that. But um, Yeah, well, in the case that uh, an issue, it was a uh, uh, the GitLab runner and uh, it was sort of, I guess, I didn't uninstall it, but it disappeared in the uh, upgrade to 4.8. And uh, I don't remember the details, but Vadim had some good reason why it was no longer supported. And so I sort of didn't think any further on it. Uh, so it was the upgrade process that well, I, I don't know exactly what it did. Okay, it, it disappeared. So I don't know if it was even cleanly uninstalled. And the, C, the CRD that was left had a bad, uh, um, a bad field in it, um, which then caused the, the chain of other errors. So you just fix that one bad field. Once you've tracked down which CRD it is, it's causing everything else to fail and magically it, it all works, you know, like self-repairing as it should do. Yeah. Uh, but let me just see where the HackMD. Yeah. HackMD. So another one that I ran into recently in uh, 4 9, and it's a shame that this isn't going to be fixed because it looks like it was fixed upstream, is there's some issue with the um, uh, basically um, a lot of pods getting uh, created to the point where you can either run out of pods or run out of networking um, with the uh, 
collect profiles cron job. Uh, the collect profiles cron job ends up creating <laughs> literally yeah. thousands of pods. And depending on your configuration, you're either going to run out of IPs or you're going to run out of pods first. Right. And, well, uh, there's, it, that happened to me too. Right. And, that's and, and been, I, basically yeah, every, so every day I would go through and uh, yeah. for, strangely it would work on, from the console. So I would have a uh, every day delete every, all the pods that succeeded and the pods that failed. And that would clean it up until the next day. Right. But it turned out that the, that was also, that was basically caused by, and, and I couldn't delete a pod from the console either. Okay. Um, and all of that was fixed by removing this uh, rogue CRD. <laughs> which of course, initially, when I deleted it, it wouldn't, it got stuck in terminating on deletion and wouldn't delete. Yeah. Uh, and so, as I say, it's very humorous uh, after you know what the cause was. <laughs> it's humorous after you've banged your head up against the wall trying to figure out what it is. I've got this issue on 4.9 with, with, uh, with uh, you know, this uh, cron job creating all of these uh, collect profiles fields. And they, they did fix it. Um, the Bugzilla shows that it's been fixed, but obviously since we're not doing core nines, we're not going to get any of that. So I'm going to have to upgrade that particular cluster to 410 just to get it to stop or run a script that just deletes those all the time. Right. Well, there is a, uh, well, but probably there's the separate underlying issue that I ran into. Um, and I, I was following a, a knowledge base uh, thing that I found from Red Hat on uh, packages won't delete. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, although that didn't fix it because of, you know, the, the uh, uh, internal server error. And funnily enough, I did get a, uh, even though I wasn't asking for Red Hat support, I did get a lecture from the guy that had the knowledge area saying that uh, OKD wasn't supported, please contact the OKD community. <laughs> did you say I am the OKD community? <laughs> well, no, I, I wasn't that hubristic. Uh, I, I did say, yeah, no, that, that's what we tell people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, in the last few minutes, is there anything else that folks want to talk about uh, before we end the meeting? Well, I, I actually have a question about that because one of the things that was said, you know, what, six, seven, eight months ago was that bugs that we find in OKD you know, will be looked at by whatever team and that this is, I mean, not a supported product per se, but, you know, we don't get the runaround of saying that this is OKD versus OCP. You know, we can open bugs for OKD and they will be fixed because they'll probably exist in OCP also. So that, that seems like a, a weird response based on what we've gone through. Yeah, it, it, that's probably more due to uh, lack of, of uh, involvement or, or knowledge on, mm -hmm. on that person's part. Um, I, I do think in general, uh, especially if it's something that is also an issue or a potential issue in the product, uh, the developers are supposed to look, look into that. Um, we are trying to promote this effort more internally and, and raise awareness that we aren't, that we are part of Operative essentially and that uh, each and everybody has to do their part. Uh, and that, that's a process, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, I, not the ideal response I would have, uh, uh, I would have given, but um, yeah, if it's a real issue, uh, it'll be looked at uh, eventually. And they just keep pressing in that case, uh, I would say. And don't be too surprised if, if people don't know. I, I've had conversations with Red Hat folks, uh, sales folks, and other engineers uh, who are doing sales support who don't know what OKD is. And they're like, well, here, let me tell you about OpenShift and all the great things it does. And I'm like, yeah, I'm co-chair of the OKD working group. I, I get it. And they're like, the what? And it's like, yeah, okay. So it's, it's we need to do some work. <laughs> and I think the, the Red Hat folks need to do some work internally uh, to help promote it. Yeah, this is an ongoing thing. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. This is about so now we're about something like twenty-seven people in Red Hat. So there's bound to be folks that don't know about 
specific thing, product or community or thing like that. So yeah. But if you're doing, if you're working with, if you're an open shift salesperson, you probably should know about OKD, I think, or an open shift engineer, you probably should know about that. Uh, yeah. I think the engineer is more than the sales people because sales people can't sell OKD. Right? <laughs> That's true. That They're is true. about to not like it. <laughs> but engineers, yes. Um, and I think that, that, that is also part of, of uh, kind of offloading the release engineering work to to this other team because that will be kind of used as onboarding for lots of new engineers um, get used to and, and to get to know the whole ecosystem because a lot of engineers they come into a team and then they have a very specific focus and they don't um, and and obviously that that's enough to to be effective on on those teams they don't need to understand or know the entire ecosystem but it is there and um, awareness um, should also be there so we are working on it, All right. It's an oh. ongoing thing. Every time we onboard new people, it's really okay. just part and parcel of it. So we're we're aware. Salespeople are interesting. Fantastic. Very cool. All right, folks. We're at time. Just about. So thank you so much. It was a great conversation. Lots of technical stuff. Lots of detailed stuff. And looking forward to more. Yeah. So yeah, if you uh, haven't upgraded, we'll I highly recommend the new the new uh, release. The new ten, uh, yeah. I upgraded this morning and it went amazingly smooth. So, knock on wood. Excellent. I'll be doing a vSphere probably tomorrow of it. So, that's great to hear. All right, folks, let's uh, call it a day, and um, we'll see you next time, same bat channel, same bat time. And Cheers. Um, feel free to do some asynchronous work because we can always use some asynchronous work on some of these discussion issues and stuff, and. And Mohammed, I see you in there. You, you, we uh, we got to talk security stuff soon. So, all right, folks, talk to you soon. Bye. Take care. Thanks, everybody.